Kia ora koutou katoa. Um, welcome to the um, afternoon session, um, part two of Tools of Applications. This is also the last session uh, for our conference. Um, my name is Alexandra Pavlik. Uh, I will be your chair uh, for this session. Um, we have seven uh, speakers, seven um, talks. Uh, one of them is a lightning talk, one of them is a demo, so a variety. And um, without further ado, uh, we will start with the first one. Just actually one note before we start. I do encourage you to ask questions. So um, apart from um, our lightning talk, we have time for questions after each talk. And uh, you can ask questions using the live Q&A. Um, you should be able to see that option um, in, your, um, in your menu. Uh, and I also encourage you to have a discussion in the general discussion forum, but uh, definitely to ask questions. And um, our first talk is titled Weather Forecasting in the Cloud, Air Leaks Cloud High Performance Computing. And talk is given by Wolfgang Hayek, who is the HPC Research Software Engineer at a National Institute of Water at Atmos and Atmospheric Research Niwa. Uh, Wolfgang, over to you. Yeah, kia ora koutou and uh, good afternoon and thanks very much for the introduction, Alexandra. So yes, um, I want to talk about um, the, the very aptly named um, weather forecasting in the cloud. Um, I'll actually talk just a little bit about weather forecasting and mostly about the cloud or more specifically about cloud HPC. Um, so just to avoid uh, disappointment, um, I can't actually show you any performance results just yet because we're still working with the cloud vendor on this. Um, so there's also work in progress. So hopefully um, at some time in the not to distant future, I can show you that. However, um, this is not actually what I really want to talk about today. Um, so I think the um, performance um, is more a secondary importance here. So the um, my actual messages are a little bit different, but I'll, I'll come to that. And I also saw that um, Tim Brown from AWS um, is talking about um, about cloud and, and possibly cloud HPC. So I hope I won't steal his thunder too much. OK, um, the quick overview of what I want to talk about today. Um, so first, a little bit about operational weather forecasting and why we got interested in cloud HPC, then a little bit of definition, what I mean by cloud HPC, and then the core part, um, the learnings. So um, you might know that uh, Neva uh, does operational forecasting. We use the unified model, um, which is a program at the UK Met Office um, to do that. On the right hand side here, you see four examples from our four current main operational models, all the way from the, um, the biggest model, which is the NZLAM on the top left, um, to the highest resolution model, which is an Auckland wind model, which was created for the America's Cup. And um, apart from these weather forecasting models, which are by far the most computationally expensive part of our operational forecasting, we have a whole flock of um, additional forecasting models for river flow, for um, wave forecasting, ocean forecasts, and so forth. And um, apart from that, again, um, there's also a whole flock of um, pre and post processing tasks um, that are part of this. Um, and so the reason we got interested in cloud HPC was that um, for our operational forecasting, we need uh, disaster recovery capability. So um, if a, a big storm or something worse um, takes out our operational forecasting, uh, or, sorry, if, if, uh, if a storm or something worse um, takes out our uh, main HPC in Wellington, uh, we need the ability to switch over to a secondary system. And um, at the moment, uh, we're using the, the Coupe. Um, HPC in Auckland for this, um, but having a secondary system is quite a costly affair. And so um, that's how we got interested in exploring the cloud for that purpose. And so um, we set up an HPC pilot. Um, so um, uh, basically just going through the um, the, the basic things that, uh, that we needed to do to test whether the unified model runs well in the cloud. I mean, it was almost certain that it was, was pretty much a yes already from the start that um, this would run, but we needed to see for ourselves. And um, so we went then off um, to configure the HPC to um, in the cloud to uh, then build the unified model code and try it out in a cloud instance and then do the usual thing um, that you would do on an HPC scenario. So where you, um, you run profiling to look at how the code performs um, and, and then to understand the, the timing. So to understand how much resource it, um, resources it takes and how long um, these models run um, to then try and estimate some pricing um, because ideally this um, should be cheaper than, than running your own HPC, right? Um, 
And um, then, uh, and this is what I really want to talk about today here. Um, what is it like um, to to run in a cloud HPC? So how do you configure a cloud HPC and how do you use it? Okay, so um, the cloud, of course, is is a, is a lot of things. Um, so I recently heard the the quip, um, which I quite liked. Um, cloud is just someone else's computer. Well, yeah. <laughs> so I think that, that pretty much sums it up. It's not your own computer system. So you're basically renting a computer system. But um, there's a little bit more to it. Um, and um, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. So what the differences are between running uh, a weather forecasting on your own HPC and um, doing the same thing in the cloud. Um, also, uh, we're only trying the public cloud, so um, we try services that um, are available to everyone um, and not um, uh, kind of a hosted or managed HPC system. You can get that as well, of course. So if you you can you can um, uh, you can put up a contract um, with a commercial provider um, who will run uh, an HPC that is completely dedicated to you. Um, but um, of course, for us um, with um, disaster recovery, our intention was um, to use just uh, the the public uh, the publicly available services that vendors provide. Um, so what do we need for cloud um, HPC for, for running weather models? Uh, so first of all, we need lots of CPU cores. Um, so in the weather forecasting world, um, it is still mainly a CPU show. Um, GPU is coming. Um, so there are codes now that, that support GPU and they, they have been supporting GPU for a number of years, but um, a lot of codes, including the unified model, still heavily rely on CPU. So we need lots of cores. And then um, very importantly, we need um, a low latency, high bandwidth network. So this is something that um, that the cloud hasn't had for a very long time. I mean, cloud obviously has been around for probably the best part of the last 20 years, but um, um, but not so much um, in terms of um, the, so the offerings did not really include um, the this kind of fast uh, communication that you need um, to run a large code like the unified model, which is MPI based. So you need um, a very fast way to communicate. Um, another important ingredient for us, at least at the moment, is to have a fast parallel file system. So on, on our uh, current HPC, this is called um, GPFS, aka Spectrum Scale, um, or Luster is, is another one of those. Um, and so the, the current code uh, requires that um, to write this output. Um, in the future, there's a lot of talk about object stores these days. Uh, we might be able to, um, to write directly to an object store, but we're not quite there yet. So for the time being, um, parallel file system it is. And then, of course, you need a way to configure the whole thing and um, ideally use a workload scheduler like Slurm or PBS, um, like on our current system. Um, of course, um, cloud vendors um, offer you the ability to use um, custom APIs to provision the, um, so to, to um, spin up shutdown nodes um, and, and place um, your workloads there. But um, it is much easier coming from the HPC world if you can do the same thing with Slurm and PBS um, and the likes. And that is indeed possible. A quick look into the market. Um, so I just show um, some more details about uh, probably the most well-known um, cloud providers like AWS, Azure, and Google, um, but there are many others. Uh, so as far as I know, Oracle offers um, HPC services, um, and then HPE offer um, HPC services in the cloud. Um, so when you compare these offerings, um, you'll find that um, they're actually fairly similar. So um, you have a compute resource, um, and the vendors offer um, uh, quite um, it's a specialized um, uh, compute instances um, that come with lots of cores, a decent amount of memory. So what you need basically for HPC. Then the all important network, um, vendors have gone to different solutions there. So AWS offer um, their, their own solution, Elastic Fabric Adapter. Um, Azure decided on InfiniBand, which is quite a well-known quantity in the HPC world. And Google use, as, as far as I understood, um, low latency Ethernet at the moment. Then storage, um, that's where it gets quite interesting. So um, we have um, an object store uh, in the cloud. Um, so that's uh, that's coming across all cloud providers. Um, so different names for different places, S3, Blob, Cloud Storage. And then um, we have Luster as the parallel file system. And then finally, um, we have um, different configuration tools for each of those um, that, uh, with which you can automate um, your HPC configuration, which is extremely handy. Okay, so. Um, when, and now we come to the core part of this talk. So, um, of course, people have been using the cloud for a very long time. So, um, including weather forecasting has been done for a very long time in the cloud, many years. Um, 
I think for um, cloud HPC specifically, um, this is something that's still coming as far as I know. There are probably places that, that are already running in the cloud, but um, as far as I know, um, a lot of the large codes still run in on-premises um, data centers. And so, um, so I think there's this, uh, so people are gathering um, experience with the cloud, but um, that's all still in the works to some degree. And um, so for us, um, our tests have been very encouraging. So the, the performance is great, um, very competitive with uh, what we're currently seeing on our own HPC. Um, and um, I also found it personally pretty straightforward to use. So it is not too dissimilar from, from using your own HPC. You just log on somewhere else, basically, and you get to configure the whole thing. And so that's, that's certainly a difference. Um, on the typical on-premises HPC, you might have to find a compromise between many different applications where um, you set up your I.O. system in a certain way. You, you uh, make choices around what kind of compute you want, um, process and hype GPUs. In the cloud, um, you can easily be spoiled for choice. So um, there you have a lot of um, different configuration options and um, you get the the option of um, automatic spin up and shutdown so you still talk to slurm um, or pbs or, or something of that kind you submit your jobs but then in the background um, these workload managers go off and automatically spin up and shut down instances for you which is really nice so this is the the architecture that we used um, so again, uh, quite similar to what we currently have, at least in principle. So um, you configure a head node, um, which will run Slurm. Um, and um, I put in Silk here because um, Silk is a, a very important tool for us for orchestrating the weather forecasts. Um, so that all runs on the head node. And then um, we set up two different um, partitions, um, so similar to what we currently have on the Maui HPC, um, one for the big compute, like the unified model, and one for the smaller things. Um, like uh, the pre and post processing jobs. Um, we didn't actually run pre and post processing, but this was just um, to try it out um, to see how that works in the cloud. And all of these nodes can talk to a centralized um, fast storage. So also similar to what we currently have on the HPC where we have a global file system. And now the main difference um, here is the object store. That's something that we don't currently have. And um, the object store um, does make quite a difference actually when you, when you start using the, the HPC. And so, um, so that brings me to two main differences that I spotted. Um, so coming from, so I've been, I've been using HPC now for many years, um, but, uh, but so far not in the cloud. So one main difference is that um, uh, in the cloud, um, you tend to use um, ephemeral setups. And that means that um, you don't normally um, provision the resources persistently apart from uh, from a central storage place, of course, so you need to keep your data there, but um, but at least the compute and um, potentially also high performance storage doesn't have to be persistent. And it's actually um, advantageous, especially in the light of disaster recovery, um, to provision that on the fly. And of course, that implies that you have to automate a lot. So um, yesterday, there have been quite a few great talks about, um, about uh, workflows and workflow orchestration and automation and so forth. And in the cloud, um, this will become your best friend. Um, so that's really what you want to do. And um, you can um, coin that in um, event-driven workflows. So for us, um, for disaster recovery, that would mean that you can basically flick a switch and then um, you provision your, your cloud HPC in the way you like it um, and then start um, your, your forecasting workflows until um, your, um, your disaster recovery phase is over and then you can shut down the whole thing again. Um, and the second big difference, as I already said, is the object store. So in case you're not familiar with object stores, um, they are quite different from um, POSIX file systems in that they're quite simple things. So you can only push a whole file into them, get the whole file out or delete it. But you can't um, read a partial file and you can't, um, you can't modify a file in place. And that has consequences, of course, um, with regards to how you use that, uh, that object store. But um, it is quite advantageous to use it over a parallel file system because there's typically a huge price difference between the two. So in theory, you could just um, put everything on a parallel file system as we have it on our own HPC, but um, that's quite pricey. And in fact, of course, it's the same on our own HPC. Um, and the file system actually costs a lot. So it's, um, it is clear that um, you pay the price for it um, for, um, for using um, that solution. Um, a few more impressions. Um, so. Again, um, data storage, I think, is um, is really a key issue here um, because, um, first of all, um, the the cloud HPC is not directly around the corner, right? So it is probably um, uh, some geographical distance away, and that means that you have to transfer your data and uh, you have to think about um, 
where your compute goes. And so the, the compute should be close to the data, of course, but then you'll find that um, not all cloud data centers have all the hardware options in place. They can they can differ um, between between vendors, of course, but also uh, with the same vendor, um, it can there can be differences. And so you have to think a bit about um, what you need in terms of your, your resources and uh, then where you should put your data. And so that, that requires a little bit of planning and a bit of thinking up front. And then if you end up um, with a data center that is far away, of course, you have to deal with network latencies. Um, you might have to deal with um, data sovereignty considerations. It depends on the application, of course. Um, one thing that's also noteworthy is that um, you don't typically get to see the system load. So if you need to rely on, on resources being available at a certain point in time, um, you might have to, um, to guard against that. Um, but with, also that depends, of course, on your particular application. And um, as you might have guessed, um, there's a lot of room for optimization. So um, I listened to a talk um, the other day from, from people um, who um, shifted into the cloud. And uh, so they went for a lift and shift approach first, where um, they basically just uh, redeployed the entire workflow as is in the cloud. Um, but then uh, later on went through optimization um, because uh, you would probably want to do that to make it a bit more cost effective because of the way that um, the cloud pricing works. And that brings me to my summary. So um, all in all, um, um, I think it's fair to say that uh, we've seen really encouraging results. So, um, so it's all looking pretty good for us. Um, it's been uh, it's been really uh, very nice and easy to use. So if I've done uh, most of this work myself um, on uh, uh, working with the cloud HPC, building the software profiling and so forth. So I've really felt quite at home quite quickly. Um, as I said before, you do need to take care of your storage. So that's that's a certainly a consideration. And if you like workflow orchestrators, um, that's certainly your place. So um, you'll have um, a lot to do there with um, automation and orchestration. And that's it for me. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang. Um, we have a time for uh, one question. Actually, I do have a question <clears throat> regarding object store and its limitations. Um, and I know you work with lots of different projects. So I wonder if you have any comments um, regarding um, due to its limitation, for what for what situations object store would be um, not that useful. So for applications. Um, and yeah, I think uh, I an object store fits well around the edges of a workflow. So it's a good place to, to store data um, for persistent storage, so data that you want to keep. Um, and it's a good place um, to put the, the final output of your workflow, but it would not be a good place um, for intermediate results. Um, so if you have a whole workflow where you, you ingest data from um, either from an object store or from the outside, um, and then process it into in various stages where you apply transformations of sorts and then um, store the result, um, I wouldn't use an object store for the intermediate steps. Um, because it's um, it might not. So it, it depends, of course, on how how fast it needs to be and and what exactly you do. But um, it is probably good to to have some local storage um, for fast access and where you can have your POSIX um, semantics in place um, so that you don't need to to worry about um, how your your, your favorite um, Python tool or other processing tool deals with object stores. Um, you can just use it as is, and then once you're done, um, you just push the whole thing uh, the whole output back into the the object store. Sure. Thank you very much. And um, thank you once again for uh, uh, your talk. And uh, we will be slowly moving to our next talk. Um, our next talk is titled um, a semi-automated high performance computing deployed system to create national flood, flood maps. So a very um, relevant topic, I think, given um, the recent events in um, across um, the country, both North and South Island. And this talk is given by Hisako Shiona, uh, who is an atmospheric technician, also from NIWA. Uh, over to you, Hisako. Thank you much. Um, um, yes, today I'm talking about the semi-automatic um, HPC deploy system to create a national flat map and uh, my experience in involving this uh, project. Maate uh, um, Haomaru o Tewai. This is a um, five-year endeavor, uh, uh, sorry, um, MV, 
funded endeavor project to increase um, flood resilience in Aotearoa, New Zealand, to provide accuracy in nation, nationally consistent flood hazard and risk information, with working with the government, EWI, and other stakeholders using the information. And flood modeling is vital for um, important due to the com combined pressure, pressure of the um, sorry um, climate change, um, housing shortage and aging flood infrastructure. This information helps ensure the robust adaptation and decisions. Um, um, today I'm going to talk, uh, cover these kind of involve in, uh, sorry, this is my outline of this today's talk, the tools. The first, we focus on the modeling at the single domain and if we can run a um, cascade model on one domain, hopefully we can run for the whole New Zealand. That's the idea. And we chose, um, oops, sorry, Silkgate, um, everyone is familiar with, um, which is a workflow engine for um, cycling system and which are with many features, including um, processing each component in correct order, cycling through the job, in our case is a domain, and running on the different platform. Oh, oh gosh, that. Sorry. Yes, come on. Um, okay. Um, so I next I want to show you the um basic flow and the component on the given domain. Sorry, just yes. This is what it look like um for um flat model at the each site. And first, we um, get the information on the domain, including the geometry and the river network information. And that is get fed to the uh, program, which um, gets DEM. And we create the tide and the rainfall and the river network information and the rainfall uh, feeding into the uh, top net, which is creating the uh, flow. And then at the end, the whole thing is going to um, feed into the um, flood model, which creating the flood maps. And I'm going to describe each one individually. So geofabric, which um, as earlier presented by Rose um, Pearson in detail, open source um, Python frame and simplified automatic processing of the DEM system. And the output from here is the elevation and the roughness information, which is get used in the BG flat model. And then the next one that we, uh, we use a New Zealand tidal model using um, uh, to produce a realistic tide for forcing BG flat ocean boundaries. And then design storm developed from the height system is to estimate high intensity rainfall at the um, ungaged locations with using the different, you can choose to put the, you can choose um, return periods, different um, duration, and then also the temperature, and you can create the different scenarios. Um, in our models, uh, in our cascade models, we use, um, require two different um, rainfalls, one for the top net 
and one for the VG flag. Um, the top net is semi described, so it distributed the hydrological model for the semi in simulating catchment and water balance and river flow. Um, in this in project, um, we are going we are modeling the up catchment down to the um, flat plain to create a hydro graph for each river and that is get used again in the VG flood. And then the last one, um, the it is a two-dimensional hydrological model, open source and GPU capable, which using um, the rain and river information to simulate the flood in this in inundation, sorry. The output from here is the maximum flow elevation and the speed at the different um, gritic, um level, as you can see on the video. The example at um, one location, the left-hand side uh, that you, um, from the previous slide, that this is, um, uh, Yes, a simplified, simple um, version. And then the right hand side is the actual um, flow, workflow for each um, one of the chosen domain. And when the workflow, all the jobs from the workflow goes run successfully, and that's what we get um, as a result. And you can see the, um, the plot of the, sorry. Um, uh, this is a, um, the flat map at the case study from Waikanae. And then the star, which you can see um, that the flow diagrams um, which um, shows the hydrograph of the Waikanae um, water treatment plant. Now we need to um, do the same thing for the whole New Zealand and we come up the method to breaking up the in New Zealand into the small pieces. Um, we use a river environment classification files and broking up the broke New Zealand into um, catchment basis domain using uh, different uh, factors like such as um, building, population, train, uh, tr train and areas. And then the output um, after going through several steps uh, using a different criteria, the um, output is come up is a geo package formatted files. Um, these um, upstream geometry, for example, is used in the design storm injection point. Is used in geo, uh, sorry, BG flood, and then uh, leach ID get used in Topnet. Um, and currently, this um, latest version contain 177 domain to be pro models, and this whole process will takes about 60 hours to create a single file. Um, as a combined flow for the flat mapping system, we have first we set up the softwares and create the flat domains. And then now we just cycle through uh, each domains one by one, like so until the whole um, domain is um, processed. Things. Yeah. Um, so working this work is still um, ongoing and then but I came up with uh, came across certain challenge and I would like to share my experience so even you writing and then running um, program in the HPC but using different languages and, and in, on different platform. And 
environment settings are unique to the individual user that's caused some of the issues and I have unlimited knowledge on coming to the settings and running uh, softwares on HPC. Uh, my colleague helped me to set up um, Python environment a few years back and I was using that for everything until now. Because of the Conda um, initialization, this is from the very useful information from the um, NESI website. Um, I try to install a different uh, um, Python environment because um, it freezes the Conda settings. Um, I wasn't able to do that and then keep trying different things, but I failed. Um, thanks to the wells from uh, help from the NISI support issue was um, identified and sorted. And we also experienced a similar problems with uh, our setting as well. We have, um, in install all the um, environment to the project folder so that everyone can access and now we can use in the silk flow without any issues. Another thing why I had uh, I had um, change was um, the timing on the merging the workflow. Um, this was the first time that I was working with um, in the groups and when somebody mentioned this is all good and then they put um we merge into the um the main workflow but because of different people using different environment um it didn't work very well um we found this out the again the environment was the issues by testing um, the solution will be the testing um, the mini workflow itself by using a different user who hasn't got the same setups it, um, then we can catch up catch the uh, we can catch more um, of um, problems and then by using uh, github um, version control helps to um, uh, keep it so that everyone is up to date of current version. And the platform and project um, partition was um, another issue that I came across um, running uh, different person's um, workflows. But um, I was taught that um, by checking a resources and allocation on the NESI page, we can find out which platform is available and we can try to configure with the right combinations. And then another it could be a bit different, but the file format has changed in between the manual versions and the automatic version in the Silk, which um, calls um, the following, not the following, but the um, consecutive um, jobs to fail and it just found out that um the that yeah file format um the attribute was different between the two versions and to avoid it obviously need to ch check the output and also a bit of coding to get um for the error trappings in the summary this is what i have learned um by involving this project, um, find, learn how to create an uh, environment um, in good manner and then call from an individual job. It is a better way to code. Um, testing the small silks one at a time before merging, at the end it will save a lot of time. At the, and, version control is obviously is important when it's working with um, other people and 
um, learn to use a resources. Um, but, it is, um, but when they have a problem, then obviously ask for help from others like today. Um, next task that I have got is investigating when or when not to use in um, uh, SLAMs even on running on the slam, possibly the, some of the audience might already have got answers, but um, we have um, some Julia um, script that it is not running on certain uh, combinations. So that's what we are trying to figure out next. And I need to learn again how to um, call silk from, from, from the other silk flow and then um, because I was using the old um, copying from the old um, Silk 6 or 7 version. So um, we trying to go away from using the rows um, suite.config. Mm, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and then that's question to the audience or somebody who can help me. Um, yeah, how many lines is too many for the each individual job within the um, workflow? Um, when we, somebody else saw it says, oh, it is too messy, it's too long. So um, I would like to get some ideas of what is the best practice and, and then how many lines is too many. So if somebody can help me on that, that would be wonderful. And thank you for listening my first ever talk. And I apologize for uh, my English as well as the topic, sorry. I mean, not the topic, topic is great, but um, my presentation, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Hisako, and I think, um... I really enjoyed the presentation, and uh, no apologies are needed for uh, it's been a, it's been a great first presentation, and I think you should be proud of it. We have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is from Hilary Oliver, who also enjoyed the presentation, and um, and he says, uh, "Do you version control the workflow definitions themselves, uh, or the workflow definition itself, complexity of this project?" Mm, no, I don't think we uh, have. So we have got the um, we working on um, like uh, each model has got um, own um, version control, and then the, basically we have got um, yeah. Um, so it must be yes. answer must be yes. So the individual um. Um, person who's in, um, in charge of the different model is created on sort of um, silk. And then we also has got a different um, GitHub for the whole system. So when the one person is ready and trying to plug in and the next person is in plugging and so on. So if that makes sense, hopefully he can say yes or no with this answer, sorry. Yeah, I mean, made sense to me. Um, well, another question uh, from Phil Moho, who um, says it's very interesting talk. Thank and he's you. asking what are, the, what are the process steps of testing your workflow when you have a complex workflow, which includes different components? So do you have any advice on testing different parts? So, I mean, we started with just uh, um, um, like a, outside of silk so you just use you we use the um bash script to just uh, have um that was the first um, task um everyone's making a output file and then just trying to give it to the next person and so on so that the whole things works that was the first step we had and then now we introduced into the um the um, yeah to in, into the uh, silk environment um, and then I guess in a way um, we started from the hard words and then we just plug in uh, one by one and using the, um, I guess, um, 
like uh, this, um, this is the one location system. So we just test um, each color one by one and make sure it's given to the next um, models in the right format and right answers. And so that um, if we go from the top and if it's fail, then we just trying to figure out what is causing the problem. And then once that color is uh, successful and then move on to the next color and to see how it works. Thank you very much for this. Um, we we don't have any more time for the questions, but we have more questions. There is one from Jade. I will uh, maybe leave I, I, um, yeah. you and Jade to discuss it uh, yes. offline uh, because she's asking things that I'm also interested in in your own experiences. Yeah. Uh, so thanks once again, Hisako, for your talk. I think it was a really great, interesting talk. Um, and we're going to move to the Thank next you. talk. Uh, the next talk is titled Scaling NWP Workloads on uh, Amazon Web Services to Achieve Your Research Goals. And it's given by Timothy Brown, who is the Principal Solutions Architect at Amazon Web Services. Over to you, Tim. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Tim and I um, are both solution architects at Amazon um, focused on weather workloads. Um, and so we're happy to answer questions. We have our email on this slide and also the last slide. So please feel free to reach out um, after the talk uh, with any more questions. But um, this talk, uh, we're going to go over uh, how we architected um, or how we architected uh, our HPC workloads. So we worked closely with Wolfgang and his team um, to do that POC that he was talking about. Um, and so we'll go into depth on how we did that. We'll go over uh, some of the concepts, uh, compute networking and storage. We'll go over parallel cluster and how that brings all those components together. Um, and then we'll go over um, how we think about software environments, uh, how you can create uh, reproducible um, environments. And we'll give some application results so if you go to the next slide. Um, so parallel cluster is uh, the, you can think of it as the glue that brings everything together. So the cloud has a bunch of building blocks um, and you can build a lot of really cool things, but one of the challenges becomes, how do you bring this together into a high performance computing infrastructure to get your work done without becoming an expert in the cloud? And that's what parallel cluster addresses. So it gives you two ways to connect to the cluster, um, you can go through a normal SSH, or I have SSM written on here, but it's, it's basically equivalent, or you can get a remote desktop with PCB, and that's really useful for visualizing um, the results uh, or some, doing some of the pre-processing uh, on your workflow. And that connects you to a head node. This head node is running a Slurm scheduler, so it's standard. It has all the same commands that you've probably used on every, any research cluster that's running Slurm, like sinfo and sq. Um, one of the big differences here, though, is, is the ephemeral. So they're not actually running until you submit work to them. Um, the other component is storage. Um, so if you've set up a Lustre file system before, you're, you're well aware of uh, how challenging it can be to set that up and, and um, get the best performance out of it. Um, and so we have a, a managed service called Amazon FSx for Lustre um, that's uh, basically a one-click Lustre deployment and it gives you a really great performance out of the box. Um, and then it also backs up to S3, which is what we use for long-term storage at, at a low price. So you've got your data, you're connected to the head node and you go to submit work. Um, and what this does is it puts it into a Slurm queue, um, and then it's going to go spin up some instances. So on here, I've got three different queues. Um, for CPU, we recommend our HPC 6A48X large instances. These are um, 96 core, 96 physical core, not hyper-threaded, um, and about 400 gigs of memory. Um, so they're pretty beefy nodes, and, and they, they do a great job um, on these parallel uh, MPI-style workloads. Um, and um, 
yeah, so we, we recommend those from a price performance perspective. And you'll see if we go to the next slide. Um, you get to choose your architecture, um, and that includes your compute type. And this can be overwhelming at first, right? There's uh, almost 200 different instance types. But um, if you just stick to the HPC 6A, you're going to get the best price performance for, for CPU heavy workloads. Um, if you really have a need to use um, uh, a um, Intel based instance, yeah. uh, a really great uh, Ice Lake based instance, so latest Intel generation, uh, and that's a 64 core instance. Um, and on a per core basis, it's actually going to have better performance than the, the Milan instances, um, but you're going to pay a premium for that. So we've included um, some pricing down below and, and uh, you can take a look at that after after the talk uh, to get more information. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so we talked about compute, we talked about storage. And the next question everyone has is, um, how do you think about networking? Because uh, if you're used to a, a more of a traditional HPC system, you've probably used InfiniBand uh, or another der derivative of it. Um, and so we've got our own uh, enhanced networking protocol um, in actual hardware. It's called Elastic Fabric Adapter, uh, and we built it specifically for the cloud, um, cloud scale. Um, so it does OS by path, uh, low latency communication, um, and it can actually take multiple paths. So unlike um, InfiniBand, which is single path between two different nodes, um, this one can survive link failures, and it, it will scale up to a much larger scale. Um, and so we've shown um, great scaling performance that Tim will go over uh, later in the slide with, with EFA enabled. And it, it's very simple because it's built into the lid fabric layer, which can be used in um, either open or Intel MPI. And we'll go over the couple of flags that you need to, to set that and verify that it's set um, on a later slide. Um, and so, okay, so we talked about all of uh, the compute networking storage, and, and so how do you get this set up easily? Um, that's something that we've been working hard on, and, and we've created uh, a web interface called uh, Parallel Cluster Manager that allows you to easily deploy um, this cluster. You get to choose your um, compute networking and storage, and then it also allows you to connect and monitor um, so you, you connect to it via uh, one of those two methods, either the shell connect um, or um, via DCV. And both of those can go through the browser. So you can within client and have access to a massive amount of compute power on this cluster. Um, and we've got a, a wizard to, to guide you through that cluster creation process where you make those choices on what the architecture looks like. Um, and then you can see instances and, and um, stop uh, your cluster, which is something that's unique to the cloud, the, the ephemeral nature of it is, is you can stop, preserve all data, and then resume your research at a later point. So we really think it's, it's a great solution for um, researchers who, who need access to a, a large amount of compute power, uh, maybe for a very short period of time. Um, so uh, here we give an example of a cluster configuration file. So it's written in a YAML format, and this is what the, the web UI guides you through. Um, but what this allows you to do is you can version control this file, uh, and then you essentially have a cluster, but it's defined as infrastructure as code. Um, so any change you make to that uh, cluster's configuration uh, gets uh, committed, uh, and you can see the changes over time uh, and revert uh, if, if needed. Um, so for example, we specify Slurm by just specifying the, the scheduler at the top there. We set our um, min count and max count. And now you may be wondering, why do we need to set these um, if all the instances are ephemeral? And these are really just guardrails. So if you've paid for um, reserved instances, so those are instances that are running all the time, you'd want those instances to be up in the cluster um, at any given moment. So you'd set your min count to that number. 
And then the max count is a guardrail saying, okay, um, at any given time, I don't want to go more than 200 machines. And that's almost like 20,000 cores. Um, uh, and so, so we typically recommend if you're running um, this on demand, so um, just paying for compute as you go to set the min count to zero. And what that'll do is it'll scale your workload when you submit jobs um, and not prior. Um, so down at the bottom, you can see an output of S info, and it shows that the, the nodes are in state idle tilde. And the tilde is important because it indicates that the instance is actually not powered on. So um, it, it knows how to launch those instances, but it, it won't launch one until uh, it's got some jobs in the queue. Uh, and then they'll go into running and, and idle or mix. Um, so with that, uh, we'll go to the next slide and I'll hand it over to Tim. Thanks, Sean. So now that you've got the cluster up and running, we need to install software on it. There's quite a few different ways of doing it. The most common is using Packer, for example, and create an Amazon machine image. Um, the other one is really using package managers that are coming from traditional HPC sites. And, you know, of course, the third is by hand, which I undoubtedly got this um, comic strip from Kenneth, who's at the Easy Build. And definitely I used to be um, Jim, but nowadays I definitely have moved across to the SPAC side of the house. So highly recommend Stack if you haven't seen it already. It's a package manner that we are going to walk through here today in how to use it on AWS infrastructure. The first little blob of code there is really just cloning the repo, setting SPAC into your bash RC so that you've always got the SPAC command whenever you log into it again. The next set of blurbs is that at ISC this year, we announced a collaboration with the SPAC folks to say that we are now hosting a binary mirror. This greatly speeds up installs times. And I highly recommend that if you are going to go down the SPAC route to actually use a binary mirror and use the packages that are in, in it. So as Sean mentioned, we have EFA on the cluster already installed. So really what we want to be doing now is telling SPAC that we have EFA on the cluster and it's an external package. So this is a packages.yaml file that we put into the SPAC root directory, or SPAC root etc SPAC packages. And what we really define saying is that there's libfabric and the variants are fabrics is EFA, TCP, UDP, Basically everything is built. However, we really want to use EFA, which I'll show later on. And we're just giving it a spec, so that's version 116 with the full spec, the prefix of where it's installed and buildable is false, which really means if you, I'm going to install a package that says I need lib fabric, it won't go and build it. It will actually use the one that's installed. So then let's get on to our model. I'm going to show some scaling graphs of the UFS weather model. It is the current global weather model used by NOAA. Um, this version is an old version. It's version 2.0. So it's a C768 with 65 vertical levels. NOAA is now doing 128 vertical levels. For the test case, I ran a very simple two-day forecast with a model time set of 150 se seconds. So the C768, what that really means is if you look at the little cubes here over there in the green face of it, you've got 768 cells in each direction, which really comes down to a global resolution of about 13 Ks. So it's fairly high res, but not extremely. And so when you come to installing SPAC, yeah, using SPAC to install the UFS weather model, the package is there. You just say SPAC install minus J12, and then there's got awful string. So the install is really just saying install it. J12 is you know coming straight from the mate file kind of world where you say, okay, I want to use 12 cores to install it. Then the rest of the string that really is, I find is the biggest stumbling block for users to actually use SPAC is how to define cipher that string without using a magic um, encoding ring. The beginning is the UFS weather model. So that's the package that we want. Then a percent tells it what compiler we want to use for that package. So in this case, I'm telling it Intel. 
And so that's the traditional Intel compilers. So that's ICC and I4. Then the hat tells it what other external dependencies that we want to be using with this package. So the hat Intel One API MPI is saying we want to use the Intel One API MPI. So this is the newer Intel MPI library. And then the plus external minus lib fabric is saying we're telling the Intel One API MPI that we want to be using our external lib fabric that we just told it about previously in our package.yaml. So if you all understood that straight away, I take my hat off to you. It took me quite a bit to figure it out and it does cause a lot of pain. In which case I say, if you are interested in SPAT, check out the SPAT chat um, Slack channel. It's very active and lots of good help is on that. So once you have the model running, what does a typical you know, SPAT script look like on AWS parallel cluster? There's a, quite a few little tiny nuances that you need to know and I'll just slowly walk them through. So I typically do an IMPI debugger for so that I can actually see what the Intel is doing to make sure that the MPI library's got the placement right and all that jazz. Then I tell it the MPI fabric is the OFI, so the open lib fabric. And then the next one, line 11, is really the most important one for using EFA, is that you tell the Intel MPI OFI library that to not use its internal version. So you're setting to zero. So you're telling it not to use the internal version. Then you tell it to use the EFA. And then the next three are really just for the UFS model where I do a MPI pin domain to the OpenMP. I do KMP, so the OpenMP thread affinity to be compact. And then I say the number of OpenMP threads to be four. Then I just load the prerequisites of what I need which is SPAC load Intel one API MPI and then SPAC load UFS weather model. And then after that, I just load the lib fabric, do all the rest of the housekeeping, do an MPI exec. And then the last two lines is what you'll be seeing from the IMPI debug is to see that you actually are using the EFA lib fabric. So this lib fabric version, it's got the tilde Amazon if you see a tilde IMPI, you know you're not using the Amazon lib fabric and you end up using the Intel one. So performance does degrade. So these are something you really have to watch out for. So time to results. This was a two day forecast scaling from about 14 uh, instances all the way out to 144. It does scale really nicely initially and out to about 64 instances. And then it kind of like just plateaus out, which is really indicative of not having enough compute for it to keep it busy. So really, you know, you should, shouldn't really be going out that far to 144 instances. And we can see exactly that when we look at the cost to results. So this is you know, essentially the whole cost for that simulation. And it sits out at you know just below six dollars, which is quite nice. But then you know starts to skyrocket up to ten, eleven dollars. So really, I'd be starting to sit there going and staying down in the lower end of it, in the fourteen to sixty-four, and then really going about your budget to say how much do I really want to spend on this model uh, run based on what your research needs to do. Do you need a time to solution today, or are you okay running slightly slower and being cheaper? And then. Just to mention that we have a weather workshop that we kind of cover mostly North American models. I'm sorry, it's WARF, MPAS, and FV3 GFS, which is the UFS. And thank you very much for having us here today. And once again, please feel free, if you have any additions to reach any questions or any concerns, reach out to us. Thank you very much for the talk. Also, apologies to Sean. I, in my notes, I only had Tim as a presenter. So um, nice. apologies for not interested, uh, Sean. We have a question from Wolfgang Hayek. Wolfgang um, sent this question directly to me because he couldn't access the Q&A if, you, if you're looking for any Q&A. Asking, um, uh, would you recommend building custom um, operating system images with pre-installed scientific software to provision HPC instances in the cloud instead of using SPAC for applications that have a fixed 
workflow. Yeah, I, I can take that. Um, so it's it's not one or the other. It's um, like you can use SPAC to to create your image. Um, what, what we do find is for, for flexibility, it's helpful to install your software on a shared file system um, as opposed to creating a, an image. Um, but it, it really depends. Like uh, you have an event-driven workflow and, and you know that you want to keep that um, uh, architecture and image pretty fixed for a while, then, then, then it can make sense to create an image um, as opposed to installing on a shared file system. But both of those methods could use SPAC, the installation method. Thank you very much. And um, there are questions in q and I'm just trying to tree them. There we go. One uh, from Roland. Um, how do you control things budget-wise? Yeah, uh, I can speak to that also. Um, uh, so, so Roland, we, we have the concept of a, a budget um, and you can uh, tag uh, all of the instances that are launched and those costs will count towards a budget. So you can see uh, very easily like how much you spent out of that budget. Um, and then you can even automate like, okay, uh, don't launch more instances if we've gotten up to a certain threshold in our budget or we've exceeded our budget. Uh, and I can put a link somewhere if I can figure out how to put a link in the chat on how to set that up. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a, um, well, I guess this is a question. Well, this is a question from Roland, but I uh, wonder if this. I suppose it's to you because Roland is asking is about a particular case of is that what RMIT in Australia is using for their HPC? I do not know. Do you know? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know either. Okay, thank you very much then. And uh, we will. Uh, move on to our next speaker. Uh, this is going to be a lightning talk, so quite a bit shorter, um, about um, establishing an automated device verification process for Lumi drug scan from Janet Stacy, who is a digital sciences engineer at Institute for Environmental Science and Research ESR. Over to you, Janet. Thanks, Alexandra, and kia ora koutou. Uh, yeah, so I will just be doing a really quick run through uh, what we've done in terms of making a process so that we can uh, validate or verify that the devices that are used for the Lumi drug scan service are fit for purpose. Um, so before I start on that, just a little bit of background of what Lumi is, because some people may not be aware of what it is. So. In, this is a New Zealand based product that ESR has made uh, to deal with the problem of illicit drugs, which we get quite a bit in a year, as do other countries in the world. So the idea is that at the moment, well, prior to Lumi, uh, a person would be stopped by a police officer on the street. They might contain a bag of some sort of powder or tablets. Uh, the officer would have to use his experience and judgment or her experience and judgment to decide whether to let this person go with a warning, arrest them or refer them for a health referral pro, um, direction. Um, the sample would then be sent to a lab if it was for a prosecution, prosecutorial uh, pathway um, where it will be decided if this drug was actually an illicit drug or this substance and then that would go through to court. Uh, so Lumi fits in by being a portable device that an officer can carry around that connects to a mobile app uh, through Bluetooth and that is connected to a, a couple of uh, machine learning models in the cloud that can decide whether it's one of the three major drugs that New Zealand sees uh, regularly, which are methamphetamine, MDMA, e MDMA, that's the mouthful, uh, or cocaine, or if it's something that is unknown. 
Um, so the idea is this then enables them to make decisions based on actual evidence uh, to decide these pathways. So in order for this to actually be useful, uh, we have to make sure that the devices that are doing the scanning, which is through uh, NIR process, um, are actually giving us uh, reliable scans. So to do that, we had to work out what is in a reliable scan, uh, what metrics need to be uh, worked out uh, for a device to be considered fit for purpose, and do all this before we send out any devices to an officer to use. So that was creating a series of uh, thresholds or acceptance criteria to say that this device was good, uh, ca uh, carrying out a standard operating procedure for testing of devices, and then carrying out ongoing monitoring of devices over time to make sure that uh, they continued to perform. Uh, ongoing, this will in the future include uh, automated upload of verification data to database storage uh, with a user interface that allows people to uh, go back and re-verify devices on the fly uh, and also allows us to subset our data that we're getting in as to whether it's going to be useful for training new models for different um, substances, verification or uh, another purpose. So the setting of the acceptance criteria at the beginning was really just a statistical characterization of every observed uh, scan that we'd done in the past. So this is roughly about 60,000 scans that we used for this um, information. And we tracked whether the profile, the spectral profile that we were receiving from our scans was similar to what we expect it to be, aka accuracy, how uh, the the uh, returning absorbance values that we were measuring were uh, performing across a single device for a single sample ver versus across multiple devices for that same sample. Um, then we compared uh, different standard reference materials from NIST um, for their reliability, including certified positions where we would expect a peak in absorbance to occur. Uh, the devices have a white reference puck that is used as, to um, determine what white looks like, much like a camera. Uh, so we need to make sure those are also performing. And then lastly, we have a battery test to make sure that our batteries are lasting as long as we expect them to. So some of the key things that we had to figure out were working out what the various sources of variation were and how we might capture them, what metrics would actually cover those sources, uh, what kind of samples we should be using to test it, what uh, if any effect was, a, if a, a very variable device happened, how that affected the model, what is good enough rather than perfect, um, how we dealt with bad scans, so ones where the device has just failed um, for, a re for some reason, and then carrying out appropriate documentation based on, you know, where is the is the actual device, uh, who might be reading these reports, so how detailed they should be, so we've ended up with two different types, and a process um, mapping uh, puzzle of what to do if a device fails verification, and the steps that need to occur. So for this, I've used two R Markdown scripts um, with LaTeX pro uh, producing PDF reports uh, and ongoing monitoring of data. How are we going to deal with that? So that was my very, very fast lightning talk. Hope you enjoyed it. Come and see me if you need more info. Many thanks, Janet. Um... And uh, yeah, I encourage you to have a discussion with Janet uh, on the discussion forum. And we will now go on to our next talk. I really like the title, From Untitled One to Cron, uh, The Why and How of Publishing My First R Package. And the talk is gonna be delivered by Ji Kang, Genetic Evaluation Specialist at Beef and, La Beef and Lamb New Zealand, and Chris Scott, who works for Nessie. Over to you. 
Thanks very much, Alexander. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. Kia ora koutou. My name is G, and I work, like um, Alexander said, at uh, Bifan Lab New Zealand. Chris uh, from Nessi, and I will talk you through the journey of uh, developing our first R package today. So this project started during COVID, and it, it is really a marathon for us, uh, as you can imagine. So thanks very much uh, for giving us the chance to share our story today. Um, for those of you who are familiar with that, and in particular R Studio, you are probably uh, sharing the love of maintaining the R script called Untitled One. And uh, so for those of you who haven't used R Studio before, this is the file that gets generated automatically after you click the button to create a new R script. And quite often, this R script will grow exponentially as we start coding. And trust me, over time, it will eventually become a mess. So our motivation behind packaging up the R codes with Redden uh, was pretty simple. We're just trying not to get our um, to get um, overwhelmed too much by the programming part, uh, so we can still focus on answering our research question. So with the help from the Nessie team, especially Chris and Albert, uh, the process of writing up an R package and um, publishing it on the CRAN was actually not that painful. So I'm just going to talk through this today with um, Chris. And Chris, if we can move to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. Uh, so in this talk, I will try to explain the why we want to develop the R package. And Chris, the expert, will explain to you how we did it. And hopefully this story will give you some ideas of how we managed to combine the research and software engineer expertise together to get the job done. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, this work uh, was like uh, started a while ago. And actually, to be honest with you, that was part of my owner's project. And, and so here we ask a very simple question. Can we improve the way of forecast, forecasting large earthquakes? And the challenge for us is pretty clear. There are many large earthquakes uh, recorded in the human history, which means that we are a little short in data when making our predictions. If we look at the Alpine Fort, and so like for our friends uh, from Australia, this is just the, the, the big mountains span across the South Island. We only have about 20 recorded larger earthquakes. And the same problem applies to other major forts around the globe. Uh, so the reality is that we had our um, last major earthquake on the Alpine Fort uh, in 1717. Uh, which uh, is roughly about like 300 years ago. And we know that it can happen again at any time between 100 and to um, probably 350 years from the last rupture. So to be frank, it is very likely that uh, this will happen again in our lifetime. So no pressure. And if we can move to the next slide, please, Chris. Thank you very much. So even though we are... Uh, um, Pretty constrained that the small, uh, small data set and other technical challenges, we gotta start from uh, somewhere, right? To make the prediction. And well, something is better than nothing, I guess. In this case, we use a pretty simple model called renewable process. And um, I'm not gonna go into the details because this is a software engineering conference. In essence, we are trying to model the gaps between two consecutive earthquakes uh, so we can predict the next one. Excellent, please. Thank you. Uh, but again, the question is, um, so the, the, the problem with small data set comes back to us, uh, which is, uh, it is pretty tricky to decide which model should be used to make our prediction. As you can see from here, we've got six candidate models and they are all good uh, in, in some ways. Uh, but uh, it's just for, hard for us as statisticians to decide which model to use for our prediction. And, um, if we move to the next one, please. Thank you. Yep. To overcome this challenge, there are two uh, statistical techniques can be applied here to solve this problem. First one is model selection, which aims to select the best model based on some sort of information criteria. Um, well. Probably if you've done a little bit of stats, you can use ESC or BSE, some things like that. 
and the the, the second one would be model averaging it is uh, slightly more complicated which averages out the prediction you've made from all candidate models and in theory it should um, have better properties than uh, if you only use one model or single model inference well, that's what we call it and our hypothesis is that um is simply to see if we can beat the predictions from using the best model by uh, implementing the model averaging approach right uh, can we move to the next? thank you yeah so to this point you might get confused why i'm hearing this uh, from a, a research software uh, engineering conference so here it finally comes to the why part so we've sort of our problem, right? We've got a research question wants to be answered and we've sort of for data, which uh, only probably 20 data points and we know which models we're gonna fit. Now we need to run a whole bunch of simulation to test our hypothesis, which is a pretty typical uh, uh, process for answering that question, right? Uh, but this requires programming skills. And if we push it, it we can call this uh, software development because we are in fact, developing um, uh, a specific software which will be used to answer this particular research question. And here the question for us is, is it over the top to consider this as a software develop development process? My answer is no, because I think every scientist should uh, learn from the principles of software engineering, because we should always focus on, I actually Googled this the, the other day, and for this conference. So I think we should all, always learn to improve the our reproducibility, reusability, and uh, um, to um, focus on the accuracy as well. Uh, so, um, but uh, personal experience, I probably learned this uh, in a hard way because I couldn't remember how many times I got myself confused uh, by the codes I wrote. And uh, not to mention that there are a million times that I've lost track of the script I wrote like probably just a day ago. So good practice and uh, the principle of software engineering really helps us to answer the, the, uh, the research question. So um, if we can move to the next slide, please, Chris. Before I hand it over to Chris, like, uh, so you, you, you get some really um, um, useful stuff from Chris, I might just add a little bit background uh, behind why we chose R and uh, why we chose uh, to program in R. Um, simply put it, uh, because R is the programming language we were taught as a stats undergraduate. So that's something I feel comfortable or familiar with. And it is backed by a large community and it's free. So to me, it's a, a great tool uh, for making all of these things happen. Uh, we can specify our data models and parameters in the first place, and we can write functions to connect these dots um, to do um, like better work. And I is capable of running large scale simulation, which is pretty good for um, this case. At the end, we can take this to the next level by publishing it as the R package, which like sort of getting a product at the end, which again goes back to the um, Re reproducibility, reusability, and also the accuracy. Some people might underestimate that part, but it's actually quite important to go through all the checks um, introduced by CRAN. So make sure that the codes you've got here are robust. So I think that's pretty much the why part of doing this up package thing uh, from my perspective. So thank you very much again. And now I'll hand over to Chris and, and probably yeah, well, um, talk you through the, the, the how and um, something useful, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, G. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, the first thing I wanted to mention was that um, we, we were able to work with G through um, Nessie's consultancy service. Um, you, we, we heard about that from Maxine earlier, so I won't go into too much detail other than to mention just one thing, which is that, um, well, two things. The service is available to most, most, available to most Nessie users. Um, but also one of the key things is that we have ex expertise in sort of code development, uh, optimization, parallelization and workflows. Um, but we're usually not experts in the um, specific area of research that we're being asked to work in. So th these projects work really well when it's like a, it's, a, it's really a collaboration between the scientist who is the expert in their domain and with the expert in the, in the software engineering. So that's what makes these projects work really well, I think. Um, 
And actually, the, the, the first thing that we do when, when, when a researcher contacts us to, um, with an interest in having a consultancy project is, um, is that we set up an initial meeting with the researcher. Um, and I think we, we found, and the researchers found, this, 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 just this first step by itself is actually quite useful because it, make, it makes the researcher think about how they would um, explain their project to, to a non-expert or someone who's not really familiar with what they're doing. Um, so, so they have to, and they have to do other things like set, set up their code in a repository somewhere so they can share it with us and maybe they have to write a readme so that we can come in and make changes. So I, I think just this, this first thing, if you, if you want to publish um, your package or, or, or make it available to others, just, just, just talking to other people about your package is, is a really good first step. And uh, I think just that, that first initial consultancy meeting works really well for that. Um, okay. So next, I, I'll be honest, I, I didn't have much experience myself using R and um, I've never actually published a package on CRAN before and I've only I've probably worked with a couple of R codes. So, so it was quite interesting for me to, um, to work with G on this and, and try and learn something new. Um, but I mean, the first thing we did was we, we did a search online for, for publishing on CRAN to, to see what um, to, to see what you need to do. And we, we came up with many websites and each website has, you know, a, a really long list of um, a, a checklist of things that you need to do to publish on CRAN. And it, and it can be a bit daunting. Um, but when you look into it a bit closer, you find that it boils down to just um, many boils down to like good good research software engineering practices. So it's things like they're wanting to see that you're testing the functions in your package, um, that you've got good documentation, including examples, so that other people um, can come in and, and use your code, um, and they want to see that you're following some coding conventions or style conventions. So th these are really things that you should be doing anyway, and it, it's really worthwhile to put those into your project. Um, and not, not just for R, but for um, if you're using Python or some other language as well, it, it's really good to do these things. Um, so yeah, we've we made a plan to um, to go through and add, add these different aspects into into um, into G's code. Um, maybe we'll talk a bit more about that on the next slides. Just just give a few examples. And, and, and this is really, um, it's repeating what lots of other people have said at this conference already. So it's, not, it's nothing really new. Um, but just to give an example of how, how we did it, um, I mean, the first thing we did, we went through and um, we started documenting all the functions um, and adding examples of how they can be used. We thought we thought that was really important if, if, if somebody wants to come in and, and if we want other people to come in and contribute or use the code. Um, so on the right hand side there, you can see a bit of an example of, of, of what the documentation looks like. And I think you know, I think that might be a real function from the package, but there's actually more documentation than code in, in that case. And so we're documenting what all the parameters are doing. Um, and then at the bottom of the documentation, we've got an example of how, how the code could be used. And, and that's quite nice, actually, in that when, when, you, um, when you build the package, it'll, it'll convert this into a nice um, PDF or, or HTML, I'm not sure exactly, um, documentation, which can then be shared along with, along with, the, um, with the package when someone installs it. Um, that, that's a really nice feature of our. Um, uh, uh, one other note is that it can be a bit tedious to go through and um, document, all, like, I don't know, 10, 20 or more functions at the, when, when you're getting ready to publish the package. So it really, um, it, it's really good to do it when you're writing the code is probably, probably better because then you only have to do one at a time. Um, but but it's, then it's never never too late to add documentation, I think. Um, okay, so another thing we did was, was adding tests for all the functions. Um, so yeah, we, we found, I think someone else mentioned it as well, that you know, R, R has a testing framework called Test That, which, which works really well. It's, it's quite a nice framework. Um, the, the approach we took here was um, setting a random seed and comparing against non good output. Um, so, so, yeah, we, basically we just start at, we, we just assume that the code now is, is running well and this, this will tell us in the future if it's changed, maybe it's broken, so we, we can have confidence that things haven't changed. Um, but another thing that we have is that um, these, these static, uh, many languages, not just R, but many, many languages have um, utilities that do some form of like um, static code analysis. Um, just basically to check that code meets some some, some defined standard. Um, and in our case, we, we found like packages like DevTools Check or um, Good Practice, there's a package called Good Practice, which also I think the output from that's shown on the right hand side there, where it's telling us that um, we're missing some fields in a description file or um, we're using the wrong um, assignment uh, assignment operator. Um, so, so we ran those packages on the code and we went through and fixed all these things that, that it said needed to be fixed for the package to get published on CRAN. Um, okay. So yeah, when we didn't, when we made all those changes, we put it together. So this, this package was on um, was on GitHub. Um, so so we, we also we took advantage of GitHub Actions, which is the continuous integration, um, and we, we found that there were, somebody else had already written um, a, a GitHub Action, which is which is like a macro um, for for um, building and testing our packages. Um, so, so so it was fairly. We found it really easy to implement. Um, it, it was, it's free for public repositories, I think, to have these tests running um, whenever you push changes. Maybe you can always also um, 
automate it to happen at certain times of day or whatever. And in the end, we had we had um, we had this GitHub Action testing our package on on all the all, all the major platforms um, using the current last release and the next release of our. Um, so and this, this is really what the people are kind of looking for, which is to um, to, to, to show that the package works well on all the major operating systems. Um, yeah, so I think that was that was everything really that I wanted to say. I mean, bringing it all together, I guess, is um, you know what what were the benefits of going through this process, and I think it comes back to I hope hopefully making the package more score higher on uh, the, uh, the the fair for research software principles. Like, it's more findable. We've got um, it's reusable because there's lots of examples there that people can get started with. Um, and we've got lots of tests, so it's more robust. Um, and the other thing we found was that was really nice in this project was the collaboration between the scientists and RSC, where we had um, complementary skills and it worked really well. Um, so maybe I'll just quickly hand back to you, G. I don't know if you have any final comments on that. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I think we're running a bit late, but just a couple of things I want to add to that um, before we finish. So the reason why I thought Paris, we should put up a talk for this conference was simply to send out the message, just a, first a shout out to um, Chris for his help and um, all, all things can happen because of him. But uh, uh, another thing will be for, for us as scientists, just don't be shy to ask for help. It's okay that we don't know about everything, but also for software engineers, like you also don't be shy uh, to offer your help. It's also awesome that you, you know a better solution of making things work. So that's pretty much the, the, the reason behind why we wanted to do this presentation. And thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, very quick question because we are a little bit over time, uh, but there's a question from, from Nick who is actually next speaker. Um, Nick was asking if you um, use snapshot testing in your work. So that's part of uh, the test that, so have you used snapshot testing? Uh, no, we haven't used that. Um, I'm not actually, I don't actually know what that is. So maybe it's something to look into, yeah. Sure, thank you so much again. And uh, yeah, let's move on to our next talk. Uh, the title is Extendable Projection of Social Contact Mattresses. Uh, and the talk is uh, by Nick uh, Tierney, uh, who is a research software engineer at Telethon Kids Institute. Over to you. Great, excellent. Can you hear me okay? Brilliant. Okay. Hey, everyone. Um, so uh, briefly, um, just like introduce my background because I think it's like, interesting to hear where different research software engineers have come from. Um, so I started out in psychology and then I moved into statistics. So I focused on exploratory data analysis and Bayesian stats, uh, as well as optimal uh, facility placement and a few other things. I then moved into a position as a research fellow and a lecturer at Monash University where I worked on uh, designing and improving tools for exploratory data analysis. There we are, yeah, and uh, now I currently work as a research software engineer at the Telethon Kids Institute, and I'm employed there to maintain and design tools for data analysis. Um, so some of the things I've done and developed um, for exploratory data analysis, there's a tool called, in our package called VizDat, which allows you to give you a general overview of your data. So here we see the columns are plotted and the rows. So it's like a, a heat map of your data with the missing data and the type of data indicated. I wrote a package called Narnia, which allows you to explore um, the missingness of your data. So here's a tool uh, that we use called an upset plot, which allows you to look at the different combinations of things. This is the different combinations of variables that are missing together. Um, so on the y-axis at the top here, we have like the overall amount of these combinations of say these five variables all going missing at the same time. And then on the left-hand side, we see just in general, how much those variables are missing. Um, so the, uh, the package now has a lot of other tools for missing data to explore it. Um, I wrote the Brolgar package, and I should say that all, uh, most of this work I was with with Diane Cook at Monash University. Um, and um, so the Brolgar package allows you to take these spaghetti type plots and then to sort of spread them out and explore your longitudinal data so that you can get some sort of structured way to start exploring that kind of messy data. I currently work on maintaining and extending the Greta R package, which is written by Nick Golding. And it's this really nice approach of writing Bayesian models that's kind of similar to something like JAGS or Bugs or Stan, but instead you write it in R and under the hood it's powered by TensorFlow. So that's just like a bit of background. I just wanted to establish that. 
Um, now I'm going to talk about infectious disease modeling. Um, so in 2021, last year, I was seconded effectively onto a team that helped advise the Australian government after the COVID response in 2021. And what we were working on uh, is this, well, one of the things I was working on was this idea of social contact. So as we know, like COVID-19 spreads through face-to-face -face social contact, and there's a lot of tools and ways to think about how we can use that information. And I just want to spend some time unpacking that now. Um, so if we say like these three people had contact, so James has had contact with Luke and Nick hasn't had contact with either. So for context, these are my two brothers. Um, I'm currently in Auckland um, and they're over in Brisbane. So I haven't seen them. Um, so how would we describe that there? You could plot this visually as like a logical, have they had contact or not? So here we see a matrix and on the diagonal, James and Luke and myself, like we've all had contact with ourselves. Um, and James and Luke have had contact with each other, but I haven't had contact with anyone. Um, so this really is just a matrix. Like we could say this is true or false and we'll get a similar type of response here. Um, and we can also change this to something that's numeric. So not just have they had contact, but how many contacts have these people had? And then you might say, okay, there's like 10 times they've touched their face or something. And then other times where they've been in close proximity to each other. So extending that from there to have had they had contact to how many contacts have they had? Um, we can start to build up, say, like a way of thinking about, okay, if we know how many times a person has been in close proximity, then that's more opportunities to say catch something like influenza or COVID. Um, and we can then imagine changing this from people to age groups. So how many times have people in the age groups, zero to nine or 10 to 19 or 20 to 29, how many times have they had contact with people of the same age group or in different age groups? So this is just to bring you along like, into this space of thinking about how can we think about and model and understand and represent ways that people have contact with each other. So what do you do with this? Um, well, if you know how many times a person's had contact, then we can have an idea of which age groups will be spreading COVID. Uh, so if we don't have those so 10 year age groups is like five year age groups. We can understand which age groups might have more contact with each other. And so then in which age groups we might be getting more COVID or influenza or something. And then that helps us plan say vaccination or like understanding where to roll out certain healthcare. If we know that certain populations have like much older groups of people or much younger groups of people, or perhaps certain areas have a lots of young and older people mixing together. And maybe that means there's gonna be even more COVID. Um, you can also use this to simulate how many COVID cases would get transmitted and then you can explore how vaccination might reduce transmission. So then we can understand, say, if we vaccinate this uh, proportion of the population in these age groups, how will that impact the transmission from here? So they're a really useful tool in infectious disease modeling. And ideally, what we want to do was we want to do this for different areas in Australia, so different local government areas so that we could understand what the impact um, would be at these different areas. So then the question is, how do we know how much contact people have, right? Like, and we don't actually in Australia yet. And um, the reason is that we need a contact survey. So this is where a person, how they diary the amount and the manner of the daily contacts that they have. Mosong et al have I've done this for eight countries in Europe. This is referred to as the polymod study. Um, and what they did was they say, randomly allocated out to a person a random weekday, and they say, record every person you've been in contact with from 5 a.m. in the morning to the following 5 a.m. And the physical contact was, say, a skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact, like a kiss or a handshake, or a non-physical contact, like a two-way conversation with three or more words in the physical presence of a person. And they asked the participants to say, okay, now provide the age and sex of each contact person, the location, was this contact at home? Was it at school? Was it at leisure, transport or other? And then record the amount of time that you had with that person. And then the frequency of usual contacts with this person on that day. Oh, sorry, in general. Um, okay, contact surveys are really expensive because it requires like a reasonably um, like like a reasonable amount of time and generally people would be compensated for this time uh, to do this survey and it's just like a bit of an intensive process so that's part of why we don't have them in australia so how do we get a contact matrix then as so we're turning that survey 
into a matrix um, for a country that's not on the list. And what we can do is we can have a best guess and we can learn from the existing surveys and we can apply them to a new population. This is called a synthetic contact matrix. Um, now there's a lot of existing statistical methods for projecting these empirical, like the, from the data to new countries. Um, these are called synthetic contact matrices. Um, and then we can get setting specific survey data on household and school and classroom and workplace composition. So how many people are in households, how many people are at school, et cetera. And we can use that population information to help adjust and reweight the surveys to get to a new country. Um, Prem et al uh, have one of the most widely used approaches to synthetic contact matrices. Um, and they've been really widely used. Um, so this, and I should say like a lot of this work was actually done pre-pandemic. Um, the Premadale paper, the initial one, I think was 2017 or 2015. Um, and so like a lot of this work was like originally thought about say for the flu. So it was very, very fortunate that we had this already here. Um, and so what Premadale provided then, they said, okay, let's get 155 matrices for 155 countries. So then they're gonna reproject from this, this data from Europe to 155 countries, and they provide those as output. Um, now, a very brief explainer of the Premadale method. Um, so there's a lot here, but the core idea is that they build a model from the Polymod study after that Mossong study there, uh, and they predict the number of contacts. Um, that's like what the model is doing. And they incorporate key age information for different locations, home, work, school, and other. So they break them into four categories and they extrapolate the number of contacts to different countries using age information from those countries. And they can create a new contact matrix for a given country. So hence the 155 for 155 countries. They provide this as an Excel output here. So they have all these different ones for all locations altogether, home, other, school, and work. And then within that, each of these is a spreadsheet with 155 tabs. And these are broken into 16 five-year age bins. Uh, and they, you have to sort of have, a, you have to refer to the paper to understand what these columns mean. And so firstly, I just want to say that it's really great that they shared these outputs and these have been widely used and have had great impact. Um, but we had a different need for these. So we had this information about Australia, but the issue is that like populations are very different. So if we compare, this is like a population pyramid, so the population per capita of Melbourne and Sydney. Um, Melbourne and Sydney actually have a pretty similar population structure. They're both big cities that have a lot of young people who've moved there, say, for work. Um, but say a place like Alice Springs in the centre of Australia and Sydney are quite different. So we have a very different structure. of There's fewer younger people um, sort of in their 20s to 30s, and then there's actually a lot more much younger people uh, and then the older population structure has changed. So the issue is that if we applied this contact matrix that is for all of Australia um, to all of these, these different places, then like say Alice Springs, then we're going to get very different understanding of how to like of how COVID spreads and how we should roll out vaccines. And so what we need is a way to change it so that we can get these contact matrices for a smaller area. So what we want is we want to be able to say, take an age distribution population table like this, where this is a, an LGA called Fairfield. So that's in New South Wales. And we say, okay, between zero to five in 2020, there were this many people and five to 10 and so on. That's how it's structured. And so we get, we're going to take this information and then we want to be able to put it into a function, say like extrapolate from data and then get out some contact matrix from that data. That's what we wanted here. Um, and I should say like they did actually provide the code, which I would really congratulate them on. Um, it's just that it was like a little bit, so that was just like the GitHub repo here, which is great that they provided that. But there are a few key issues. And one is that it was code that wasn't necessarily written for reuse. So it was code that was written to describe their method, but it wasn't written with this like clear interface on how to get inputs for a given country or region. So it's kind of challenging to see which bits of code match which methods or which parts to change for your, your given country. Um, so again, like I want to congratulate them on sharing the code and they had shared the data and that's really good. It's just that there's this slightly different 
interface on how we want to look into things. And so we decided to build our own extension. Um, so I should say that Nick Golding actually wrote the majority of these methods here. Um, it was a bit more flexible. It sort of helped bridge over some assumptions that we needed to make uh, for our population in Australia. And it used, uh, it used a generalized additive model instead of a Bayesian approach. So it could be much, much faster. Um, and I was tasked with writing the software from the, from the initial model fitting code. So taking sort of that untitled one script, uh, which had a lot of functions in it, and then reformatting that into some software. Um, and we named the package, we called it CONMAT for contact matrices. Uh, and this created a home for the code base for others to contribute to. So once we had this as an R package here, then we have this way for people to add new features and extend it. Um, and so we were able to pull in other contributions from other people and it just created this nice home rather than a single script or something like that. And then I was in charge of managing that and establishing checks and um, tests and these kinds of things. Um, so briefly, here's a demonstration of how the comment package works. Uh, we have a helper function to pull in, say some data from a given LGA for Australia. So that's just a handy thing that we needed. Um, it has to have this structure here. We have a lower age limit and a population. We can then put that into a function called extrapolate polymod. What that does is it fits a model from the polymod data and then it extends it to our data, our the Fairfield data, and we get out a matrix here which has the contact rate rather than the contact number um, between say the zero to fives. Okay, thank you. Um, um, between zero to fives and five to 10 and so on. And we have this for each of these locations, home, work, etc. Uh, we can then plot that with this plot matrix function, which allows us to look at um, how many people in these different age groups were sort of in contact with each other. And we see there's this home pattern, which is like a main diagonal here where people who are the same age are in more contact with themselves, but also old people are in more contact with younger people. So that's like parents with children and that kind of thing. Uh, if we compare that to the polymod study, we see we have slight, uh, some slight but important differences here. So I just wanted to illustrate the fact that there are some differences. Um, and yeah, and now I just want to briefly talk about some of the challenges we had in the design, um, which is that like the model that we fit is kind of fixed and rigid. So here we say like extra extrapolate polymod, but we don't provide people the, um, the opportunity to change the model. Um, and so the idea was to say like we make it rigid, it's just one interface into the model. Um, and hard coding variables to things like lower dot age dot limit and population, just as what other code bases are we using that we had. And so that is now fixed and needs to be passed through um, into other functions. Um, how am I going for time? Sorry. I, okay. Um, yeah, so basically like, there are some challenges in design. It's hard uh, because you wanna make it usable, but like having a clear way to look into it, um, but also um, it, um, you know, just, it's just one approach. And so there are some ways that we could have improved this. Um, and there are other ways that we can extend this. We could make other functions where people can more clearly add a new type of function or a new type of model and then, and then do their own prediction. Um, so I'll just wrap up there and leave you on. Just want to say thanks to Nick Golding and Arthur Babu and Michael Lydia Moore. Uh, and you can learn more at the CONMAP package. And also here's a link for my talk slides here if you want to have a look. And that's it. Thank you. Top. Thank you once again uh, for your talk. Um, we have a question from Bridget uh, who um, says, um, how do you deal with anisotropic, sorry, uh, this is a completely new area for me, so I'm not sure if I okay. read it correctly, associations. So when a contact between two actors has more impact in one direction than the other, or are we mm -hmm. uh, are all contacts considered to have equal effects on each in each direction? Sure. Yeah. So we did like initially think about having asymmetric um, like contacts. So like one person, so like a teacher in a classroom, would be talking to twenty children, um, and that might mean that that like there's an imbalance in there but what we decided like effectively was that it is symmetric um 
after discussion with people who had worked in the infectious diseases space. So we do assume that it's symmetric, that it's an equal weighting currently. Thank you very much and thank you for your talk. Um, and it's now time now for the final talk. It's actually a, a demo and um, offloading work to a remote high performance computer using Globus and Fangs from Chris Scott, who is a research software engineer at Nessie. Over to you, Chris. Thanks, Alexandra. Um, yeah, so this is just um, going to be a really brief overview of some um, recent work we've done about offloading work to um, a remote cluster um, using these tools called um, Globus and Funkex. Um, the cluster is going to be Nessie in this example, and um, I'll explain a bit more about Globus and Funkex shortly. Um, let me get to the next slide if I can. Um, yeah. Okay, there are going to be a couple of slides first. I'm just going to explain the, the particular use case in mind that we had we were working with with here. Um, we'll give you a bit of background around about um, Globus and Funkex, the, the two tools we used, um, and then I'll also explain a little bit about the, the tool we actually created, which um, brings together Globus and Funkex to, to offload the work to the remote cluster, um, which is we call in remote job manager. And then, and hopefully a demo that didn't it was work, wasn't working for a bit this morning, but maybe, maybe it seems to be okay at the moment. Um, so anyway, the use case in, in this case, we we were working with a, we had another consultancy project which we mentioned earlier as well with a with a particular research group at um, University of Auckland, the pharmacology group. We worked really closely with um, Nick Alford, who did a lot of work um, testing and, and helping us with the development. Um, they're, they're interested in improving the understanding of medicines in humans and um, improving dosing. Um, and and the, the key requirement they, they have is that, that they, they want to manage their research from um, a familiar environment, which is their, their local Windows machines. Um, but, but their workflow has some really expensive steps which do need more resources than they have locally. So that, that's why they need to, um, to offload some steps of their workload to, um, to a HBC. Um, and in particular, they're, they're doing this nonlinear mixed effects modeling. Um, they have a, a Fortran MPI code for doing this, non-MEM, uh, which uses quite a lot of resources. Um, and in addition to that, they, they, they also use this approach, this um, method called bootstrapping, um, which is where they resample a single data set to create many data sets, maybe 100. They have to then run 100 simulations and, and then use it to determine you know, uncertainty of uh, model parameter estimates. Um, so they, they, do have a, they do have some steps which require a lot of resources, which is why um, they do need to use the HPC. Um, so but before I do the demo, I'll just explain a bit about what I mean by Globus and Funkex and, and some of the terminology. Um, Globus is the tool we use for, for data transfer in, in, in this project. Um, and you, you, him, I might mention Globus endpoints. So a Globus endpoint is somewhere um, that you can transfer files to and from. Um, Nessie, Nessie has what's called a managed endpoint, which means Nessie runs the, the endpoint software, and then the Nessie users can, um, can connect to the endpoint and transfer files to and from it. Um, and, and the key thing there is that that requires a normal Nessie two-factor authentication um, to, to connect to that endpoint. Um, there, there is such a thing as a guest collection or a guest endpoint, I'm not sure the exact word, um, which is where you can share a subdirectory of the, the managed endpoint on Nessie, um, and you then can control who has access to that guest collection. Um, and, and the key thing there is that the guest collection only requires Globus authentication. You, you no longer need the two-factor authentication to access it. So you can do um, Globus authentication, which is token-based. So you know you can set it up on your local machine, create the token, store it there, and just reuse it. You never have to put a password in again to, to access that, which is really good for automation. Um, yep. So that's Globus. Um, some terminology about Funkex. Um, the Funkex we're using for um, remote function execution. So we're running on the local machine, and we don't want to be able to execute some function on the remote machine, and we're using Funkex to do that. Um, the thing about a Funkex endpoint is you you start a Funkex endpoint on the remote machine where you want to be able to run commands. Um, that there isn't a managed option similar to Globus um, at the moment. That might be in the future. Um, so so what that means is each user must run their own Funkex endpoint on the on the remote machine. And if it gets killed for whatever reason, like the login node goes down, they have to start a new one. Um, yeah. uh, oh, the other good thing about Funkex is developed by the same people as Globus, and it also uses Globus authentication. So it's token based, and you just you just set up a token on your local machine, and then just reuse it, and you never have to authenticate again. Um, and yeah, it's probably worth mentioning Funkex is still being quite heavily developed and changing quite quickly. They just had a recent um, major new release. Um, yeah. So our next slide. Um, yeah, the remote, very quickly then the remote job manager tool. This is um, this is the, this is a tool we're using that, that that puts together Globus and Funkex. Um, using that it's Python based. Yeah, they have Python packages, Globus and Funkex, so really nice to use. 
Um, for file transfer, we, we're doing Globus HTTPS upload to a guest collection on Nessie. And that's the way we're going to upload and download files from the cluster. Um, running commands, we're going to have a Funkex endpoint running on the Nessie login node. Um, and then we're going to use that to execute Sloan commands like submitting jobs and checking jobs are finished. Um, so I mentioned Squantab, uh, Squantab earlier in this talk. So I will say that we're actually using Squantab to get around the problem that each user needs to run and manage their own endpoint. So we, we have a Scrum tab that runs hourly, I think, for the, for the users in, in, in this project. Um, and it, in it, every hour it checks to see if a Funkex endpoint is running on one of the login nodes. And if not, it starts one um, in case one of the login nodes has gone down for some reason. Um, current limitations is, is not, it's not really, the way, the way we've implemented this at the moment is it's not really suitable for large data because uh, we're using HTTPS upload, which was, um, was just a choice we made because it was easier. It meant that the, the researchers had to install less on their local platform on the local system, um, but and, and they only have small data. They're probably uploading tens of megabytes maximum. Um, if you needed to upload more, more, more data, you'd probably have to, um, you could modify the tool a bit to use a, an endpoint on the local machine as well. Um, and we, we do experience some stability issues. It's quite new. I think Funkex is in development and um, it's the first time it's probably been used with Nessie and, and, and also the HTTPS upload is, is probably quite new as well. Um, other than that, things have been work, work, working fairly well. Um, so, so maybe we can start a quick demo now and see if this is going to work. Um, so, so, I mean, what, what to take from this? I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't expect that this this tool is going to be, I mean, I mean it, it, it's probably not going to be super useful as it is now. I mean, it's developed specifically for this group and it probably has some idiosyncrasies for the way that they want to work. Um, but but it's probably, it's, it probably, it might be interesting for some people to see what can be possible with using Globus and Funkex. And, and it may well be useful as it is or with, with some small tweaks for other people as well. Um, but anyway, I have a local directory here. This, this is just JupyterLab running on my um, on my local machine. Um, and I've set some directories up here. E each of these two directories, you see the APOA1, underscore one and underscore two. These, these are two simulations I want to run, um, just just to, just toy examples. Um, now, probably what I'm going to do is just very quickly, I'll just explain this. This does, the, the way the way the, um, the, the remote job manager or RDM tool works is um, you provide it with a list of local directories. RDM will then loop through to the local directories, and each one of them will be a simulation on on the um, on the remote machine. So, so within each of these folders, um, API one and score one, we've, we've got a few files. So some of these files here are the um, are the input files for the simulation. Um, these are these these two are special files which tell basically RDM which which files within this directory should be uploaded. And which files should be downloaded after the simulation's finished? Um, maybe I can just quickly show um, show what's in one of those files, which is you know the, the downloads. These will be the, the files that come out at the end of the simulation, which aren't currently in the directory. Um, this this will contain a list of uploads, and, and the run.sl is just a, a normal Slurm script. Which Slurm Slurm's the, the tool we use for managing jobs on a cluster. Um, so so you know you, you can see in the, in that in that one, it's just it's just a standard Slurm script. Um, just tells you know, how many how many tasks you need, how, how much time you're going to need, and so on. Um, so, so the way this works, what I'm probably going to do now is just just start off the run, and I'll explain a bit about what's happening. So, so with RDM, we have two commands: um, RDM batch submit, which is going to which takes one argument, well, one argument that I'm going to use, which is that this that this file which contains a list of the local directories. Um, so I'm just going to run this now, and that that's then going to um, it should it should then submit the jobs. Uh, it should upload the files first, sorry. I'll create a remote directory, upload the files, and then it's going to submit the Sturm jobs that are going to do the, the processing within each of those directories. Um, and then, then we have a second command that runs after this one, which is called rjm batch wait, which then which will wait for the jobs to finish um, and then download the results. Now, now, the reason we have those two two commands, or maybe what I'm going to do is just start the second command. What we can see is that um, it's uploaded the files in a certain amount of time, and it's submitted jobs with a certain, these job IDs. So now we can do RGM batch wait with the same argument. Um, it, it should start polling um, for completion of those jobs. So it says here we're waiting for two slurm jobs to finish, um, two unfinished currently. Now, as I was saying, the reason we have the two commands is that's that's just the way that the the research I was working with in this in this project in the pharmacology group at Orp, and they, that's how they've set up their local workflow. Is that it expects to have two commands: one to do the upload and the start running, and a second one to do the download, uh, wait for it to finish and do the download. Um, it could easily be modified to have um, just just one command that does everything if, if that was um, if that was needed. So at the moment, we're waiting for these these jobs to finish um, running. Ho hopefully, they're going to start fairly quickly. You usually finish within a minute. Um, not sure how I'm doing for time. Um, 
but anyway, so we, what we can see here is that, that what, one of these jobs is finished. Um, you know, the, the, the first part, the first directory is finished completely uh, successfully, and it's now downloading the files. Um, and now we're just waiting for the second one to finish and download the files, and then, then we can just double check that the files were there and completed. Um, Okay, so it's, it's finished. I mean, if we just have a quick look in that directory, um, we can see that now there are some, some new files that are being created just now. They're, they they were the output from the simulation that ran on Nessie. Um, so yeah, I think I think that probably is a very very quick demonstration. Uh, we've, we've shown how you can have a local workflow that offloads calculations to the HPC when needed using these tools, Globus and Funkex. Um, and I, I'm really interested to know if other people have similar use cases. For example, we thought maybe there would be use cases where um, automating the processing of data, where, where you've got lots of data coming in from um, equipment, like lab equipment locally, and you need, you need more compute than you have locally. Um, yeah, but that, that's all. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chris. So I guess maybe related to your last slide, I. Um... I wanted to ask, um, you showed there is a, and, and you talked about that um, most of this is on, on GitHub in your repository. Um, mm. Is is there uh, enough information for someone to kind of take it and try and well, uh, yeah. see, use it or, or yeah, is it, is it, is it a really good question. contact you? It's a good question. It put, I mean, somebody could certainly try and it might, there might be enough information, but it's not, it's not a really polished package at the moment. Um, there, there is a quick start guide. Um, if you have an SE account, you, you could certainly try. Um, but I would, I really, um, yeah, feel free to contact. I'm happy to talk about it and help anyone to try it out if they want to. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so this was our last presentation of the session, but also last presentation of the conference. Big thank you to all speakers. Um, and it's time for some closing notes um, that will be delivered by Georgina Rai, who is from uh, Nessie. And um, I will be handing over to George. Alexandra, Tena Koto Kato, called George Tokoingoa. Hi everyone, I'm Georgina Ray, I go by George, uh, Science Engagement Manager here at NISI. Um, and I've really had the privilege to watch this event um, and in doing so, watch this community go from strength to strength. Um, it was a bit of a shame this year we didn't manage to get the in person part of the conference off the ground. Um, I think it was always going to be hybrid, but uh, even um, getting some in person was a bit difficult. But with the change in settings yesterday, who knows, next year we might be in person. Um, the organisers have asked me to, to ask you um, very kindly, please respond to the post-conference survey because we really um, would love to understand what you want in terms of um, in-person, hybrid, uh, online, and what suits your needs um, so that we can factor that into our decisions next year. Um, so want to acknowledge um, that, I think this happened last year as well, Te Wiki o Te Reo Māori, Māori Language Week, um, was coinciding or is coinciding with this event. Um, and it's really wonderful to hear um, everyone having a crack at Te Reo. Um, many of our community um, haven't grown up in New Zealand or have grown up in New Zealand, but perhaps not with Te Reo in their lives. So um, it's fabulous to hear um, that language coming through and special mention to some of our Aussie colleagues having a crack as well. Well done. Thank you, Namihi. Um, it's great to, to hear that. So in terms of this year's event, um, we ended up with about 30 speakers. I know it was a bit tougher squeezing all of um, that good content into, into two days. So perhaps that's another thing we need feedback on, how we, um, how we uh, include everyone in the program. But um, you know, do we extend? Do we stream? Who knows? Um, about 65 attendees, I think, we had noted down um, yesterday anyway, and they, these came from New Zealand and Australia and the US this year. Um, and we had a theme around sustainability. So communities, digital practices and tools. Um, and this really came through really clearly 
in the keynote. So well done to the committee for uh, landing and <laughs> arranging Alexandra Pavlik and Dan Katz. Um, a, a real emphasis around fear for research software, which is something I personally think is going to be um, really important and has uh, it's played second fiddle to data, right? Uh, fear for data is... Um, everyone knows, but fear for research software is going to be just as important. Um, so understanding that's really valuable for this 